the lesson that I'd like us to focus on uh, as a title, it will be Woe to You Double-Minded. Woe to you who are double-minded. All right, now I'm going to have to take this very slow because I certainly don't want anyone to miss it and I do know that we have some first timers that, that are on as well. So I don't want to say anything that will go over your head. And again, for you who are um, logging in for the first time, uh, don't be uncomfortable by what you hear. In other words, if you don't fully understand, don't let that trouble you too much. I do have a, um, a brief Q&A at the end that you can ask some questions, as well as um, uh, I can speak with you at a later date and fill you in further as to where you can go and get the information via YouTube. All right. So the subject matter is, woe to you, double-minded. Now, the reason for this title is it's quite simply because we do have within the community of those who are called by the Most High God, uh, those who are in this truth, and when I say truth, I mean the understanding of who you are according to the scriptures. Because not everybody understands who they are according to the scriptures. Um, and the second point is this, that you cannot have one foot in um, something else and another foot in this truth. You, you either have to be 100% in this truth in order for you to fully understand what it is that the Most High is trying to reveal to you. And secondly, if you're involved in, in so-called Christianity, and again, for those of you who may be wondering, what do I mean by Christianity? Christianity is a made-up word. It has nothing to do with being a Christian. And, um, and I've covered this in weeks gone by, so I'm not going to go into depth with that. But Christianity is a made-up word, very similar to the word democracy. That's why you'll find the word democracy and Christianity are spoken um, in the same terms. Now, being double-minded is an area that we should all try our very best, our level best, to avoid. Because what it does, it breeds confusion. Confusion puts us in a situation where we, we then um, go backwards and forwards. I have a good friend of mine who has some family members. And sadly, um, he informs me that they, one minute they, they believe in keeping the Sabbath, and the next minute they don't. And one minute they believe that um, we are the children of Israel, and the next minute they don't. And what it does, it, it breeds confusion. And that's why these individuals are unstable. Watch what the, the scripture says. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 33. 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 33. When you have it, let's read. Book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. For Yahweh is not the author, author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. See that? So it makes it very clear that Yahweh, Yahweh is the Hebrew name for God, our, our Father which is in heaven. Um, and again, for you that are new listening to this for the first time, you'll be wondering, what does Yahweh mean and so on? Well, simply that our Father, which is in heaven, he has a name like everyone else has a name. When we keep on calling him God, we're calling him by a title. Um, it's, it's like I'm a man and you're a woman. If I continually keep calling you man and not, or woman and not by your name, after a while, it gets confusing because anyone can respond to the word man or to the word woman. Anyone can turn around at that point. Hey, woman. Half a dozen women turn around. Hey, man. 
half a dozen men turn around. So, but when you call a person by their name distinctly, then it catches their attention. So when we use the word Yahweh, we're using the name of the Father according to the Scriptures. All right. Now, our officer just read the Scripture, and the Scripture said, for God, I'll read it verbatim, and he will read it um, as we would as normal, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. So in other words, we do not serve a, a, a God, uh, our Father, which is in heaven, who um, puts us in a state of confusion and bewilderment. He doesn't do that. He said, it said that for God is not the author of confusion, but, watch it, of peace. Of peace. There must be clarity. There must be peace, tranquility. As in all churches of the saints. Now, remember, only, there's only one group of people that can be the saints. Not everybody in the world is the saints. And again, that, uh, again I'm not going to elaborate on that. But there are only certain people that are the saints. And so it lets us know very clearly that he's not the author of confusion. He is the author of peace and, um, and of the saints of the Most High God. You can't have one foot in the truth and one foot in a lie. It just creates plain and simple confusion. Now let's go to uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. All right. The book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which, which also is in the Yamashiach Yahawashai. Notice what it says. You, it says, let this mind be in you. In other words, the mind can't be in you unless you let it. You can't have this mind unless you let it. You can stop it. You can hold it back. You can refuse it. But in order to have this mind being in you, you have to let it. It, it comes from the word uh, kenosis. Kenosis, uh, K-E-N-O-S-I-S, kenosis. And simply what it means in the Greek is to empty oneself of what was previously in you. Again, uh, in, in, in the world of physics, it says that two forces cannot exist on the same plane at the same time. So that would then mean that one has to go so another one can come in. It's like information. If you have the same information that you had in Christianity and you were operating by that, that would then mean that you are still stuck there and not moving away from that. So in order for that to change, you have to make a decision. Jump back, officer, if you please, and read verse 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. Fulfill ye my joy, but ye be like-minded, having the same love, being on, of one accord, of one mind. So notice what it says. In order to fulfill uh, his joy, the Father's joy, it tells us clearly that you must be like-minded, having the same love. And then it goes and says, being of one accord, of one mind. So we have to have one mind. We have to be on one accord. We have to operate together. It makes it very, very clear to us. That's how we fulfill his joy. So it's making it very clear to us. In order for us to be in this position, to, uh, to have kenosis, to empty ourselves, we've got to first get rid of the old information in order to allow the new information to come in. Let's go from here to John chapter 8 and verse 32. It's a very familiar text that we've all uh, read from time to time. John chapter 8 and verse 32. Book of John chapter 8, verse 32. 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So in order for us to succeed in this truth, we have to know the truth. It tells us, and you shall know the truth. The question now is, what is the truth? The truth, according to the scriptures, 
is the law. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, making wise the simple. We read that in the book of, of Psalms. So in order to, to know the truth, you have to operate by the law's statutes and his commandments. All right, from here, let's go to Matthew chapter 10 and 19. Matthew chapter 10 and 19. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 19. But when, you, when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. So it's telling us right there that when we are speaking to individuals about this truth, you don't have to be rehearsing what I'm going to say to them. Well, I'm going to say this to him, or I'm going to say this to her, or, or that to her. It doesn't matter. The scripture lets us know that the Roak, the spirit of the Most High God, it's in play. Now, we, we have to recognize that the spirit of God is still operational. It is still operational. And, 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 and for those of us who, who, who go on a tantrum and say, oh, yeah, 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 I wonder what we're going to talk about the spirit. Well, well, well first of all, you've, you've missed it. You've missed everything if you think the spirit is separated from the word. Because the word came by the spirit. The spirit came out of the mouth of God. Therefore, when his word is being spoken, and then we're reading it, we are embracing the spirit. And, and again, they don't teach it in a Christian church. They teach everything to be separate in separate boxes. No. The truth is the spirit. The law is the spirit. The word of God is the spirit. And when we read it, it makes complete. That's why it says, but when they deliver you up, in other words, in that there is a time coming that many of us are going to be taken into captivity by the authorities for, for speaking about the scriptures. Right now, they don't want to hear it anywhere. Right? You, you, can, you can talk about being a Muslim. You can talk about being a, a homosexual. You can talk about anything you like, but don't talk about the scriptures. Don't talk about God. People don't want to hear that. We are living and experiencing that age right now. Well, the writer goes on to say, take no thought how or what you speak or shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. In other words, the Spirit of the Most High God is going to move on you so that the words that you did not have in your heart, in your spirit, he will put it there that you will be able to speak and speak a sound uh, word to whomever it is that you are communicating with. But then when we go on, and I'll read this since I'm already there, in verse 20 it says, for it is not you that speak. See, it's letting you know now, it's not you that's speaking, watch it, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in heaven. It is he who, who is doing that. And that's why when you quote the scriptures as you're speaking to someone, you are speaking his word by the spirit because his word that comes from the book is the spirit. Let me read it again, verse 20 of Matthew chapter 10 and 20. It says, for it is not you that speak, but the spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Making it very clear. This is how the spirit is moving. And remember, in these last days, we are seeing a move of the spirit like we have never seen before. It's not, it's not church as usual. It's not the same thing as you. And this is why there are many who, who, who will feel like some have gone off or gone astray because they've missed it. Because everything to do with Israel is tied to their history and the word. The book that we read called the Bible, in the Greek they call it the Bibulos. And, but in the Hebrew we, we call it the scriptures. The scriptures is, is for us to live by. Uh, all right, let, 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 me, let, me, let me hold myself. Let's go to James chapter 1 and 8, please. James chapter 1 and 8. And then we will 
begin to uh, open it up further. James chapter 1 and 8. <clears throat> Book of James chapter 1, verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Notice what it says here, making it absolutely clear. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Double-mindedness. In other words, you haven't got singleness of thought. You haven't made up your mind. You are not sold out. You are not converted. You are not convinced of what this word is saying about you being who you are. You are still perplexed or, or, or betwixt. You still have one foot here and another foot there. Maybe not literally in, 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 in a church here and a church there, but in your mind, you're conflicted. And that's why it makes it very clear here. A double-minded man is unstable. Is unstable. Makes it really clear. I don't know how much clear we can make that. Is unstable. How, how does it say? It says he's unstable in all his ways. So male or female, if you are unstable in this truth, or if you are double-minded in this truth, you are unstable in all your ways, according to the book. Now, to take it even further, let's open it up further by going, if you please, to Jeremiah chapter 5 and 23. Jeremiah chapter 5 and 23. <clears throat> All right. Book of Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 23. But this people has a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are, they are revolted and gone. Notice what it says, but this people, this people, so he's speaking about a specific people. Which people is that? It's us. Israel. But this people have a revolting. A revolt means to always to cause clamor, war, arguments. Um, always ready to uh, sometimes be um, condescending. But this people has a revolting and a rebellious heart, that they are revolted and gone. Now, the word rebellious is an interesting word, because remember, any word that has the, uh, the prefix before it, in this case, R-E, it always means again or back. So when we read the word re, that means either again or back. But the, what the word that, that, that really intrigues me is the word bellious. The word bellious is where we get the word war from. So it means that these people are, are, look, are looking to make war all over again. <laughs> so it's telling us that in our rebelliousness, in our rebellion, we're trying to make war. Now, that's futile, because we who don't know about war is trying to make war against he who knows everything about war. All right, let's quickly go. Go to, uh, go to Exodus chapter 15 and verse 3. Let's just read that real quick, and then we'll go back to James. Book of Exodus, chapter 15, verse 3. The Most High is a man of war. The Most High is his name. Isn't that interesting? It tells us right there, clearly, that the Most High, God, our Lord, he's a man of war. The Lord is his name. Let, let me read it again. I'm, 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 I'm. The Lord is a man of war. So he knows how to make war. It, it, it is part of him to make war. It's his, it's, his, it's his knowledge. He, in fact, created it. 
And if he's the maker of a thing, that means how can you overcome the very one who knows how to make a thing? He knows how to make war. He calls this war because he's the, 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 the master over everything. And, and since his mastery is over everything, it, it says here, the Lord is his name. Now, for some of us that may be struggling with that just a, a wee bit, let's go to Psalms 46 and 7. Um, Psalms 46 and verse 7. All right. Book of Psalms, chapter 46, verse 7. The Most High of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. So the only way that we're going to get refuge or peace is through the Most High. Why? Because he knows how to cover us in times of war. That's why the scripture says, they that dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He knows how to cover us in times that are warlike. But then, let's look even, even further. In fact, let's go, back, no, let's go back to James. I don't want to digress too much. So let's go back to James. Let's go back to James Chapter 1, and let's read verse 8 again, if you please. Book of James, chapter 1, verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, let's, uh, let's look at that more closely by getting a precept to go along with that. Let's go from here to Isaiah 33 and verse 6. Because it uses the word unstable. Unstable. And I think we need to establish what is it saying when it uses that word. Book of Isaiah, so, chapter, 30, chapter ahead, 33. Sir, Book of Isaiah, chapter 33, verse 6. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the st stability of thy, thy times, and strength and salvation. The fear of the Most High is his treasure. Is his treasure. Now, watch what it says, as the officer just read. The wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability. See that? You should underline that word stability. Because the scripture says that, that um, a double-minded man is unstable. And yet, we're reading in the scripture where it tells us that wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of their time. So when we study the word and we get wisdom and we get knowledge, we become stable. And if you, have, and if you are stable, then you have stability. And if you have stability, then you have foundation where your roots will only go down further to allow you to grow greater. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I want to take my time with this because I, I really want us to be very, very clear in who we are, what this truth is about why we, we worship on the Sabbath and why there are certain foods we abstain from and why we continue to follow the law. Again, let me repeat what the psalmist David said. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, making wise the simple. Even if you're simple-minded, this truth will make you wise. So it tells us clearly here, and wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability, again, for those of you that are just joining us, Isaiah 33 and 6, the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. It's the strength that will save you. That's what salvation means, to be saved. Are we saved now? No, we are not. And that's an expression that they use a lot in Christianity. I'm saved. I know I'm going, I'm saved. No, no, no. The Bible tells us, the scriptures tells us, that he who endured to the end, the same shall be saved. You've got to make it to the end to be saved. The writer goes on to say that the race is not for the swift, nor the battle for the strong, but for those that endure. So it's an enduring. You've got to endure to the end to be saved. So it says the strength of our salvation. Watch it. The fear of the Most High God is his treasure. 
when we fear him and respect him, that becomes a treasure with him. Let's go from here, if you please, to the book of Exodus. Let's go back there for a quick minute. Uh, let's go back there. Uh, my battery is running low. I think I'm going to have to get a, uh, plug it in. <laughs> Excuse me. But go ahead. Go ahead. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Where, where did we go? I'm, I'm sorry. Let, let's not go back to um, uh, uh, Exodus. Let's go uh, to Jeremiah, and let's go to Jeremiah chapter uh, shall I go there? Um, let me see, let me see, let me see, let me see. Um, let's go to, yes, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 5 and 23. Jeremiah chapter 5 and 23. Book of Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 23. But this people has a revolting and a re- rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. All right. So we, we read it earlier on. It lets us know that it's the rebelliousness of our continual revolting that puts us in the, in, at enmity with our maker. And, and again, I, I please would, would, would impress upon you to highlight that scripture because, again, when you see things start to come up and, and, and situations start to turn a certain way, you have to remember where is this coming from. It's coming from a rebellious spirit. All right. From there... Uh, Let's go back to James, if you please. Let's go back to James chapter 4, and let's go back to reading verse 8. Book of James. Book of James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw nigh to your your hour, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands. Go ahead, sir. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. And purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Right. So it's telling us very clearly here. It says to draw nigh to the Father, and he will draw nigh to you. Then it uses the word, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts you double-minded. So you see that that word double-minded still seems to be playing with with, with us there in terms of who we are and how we ought to be. Now, what I want to do, if you you will allow me, I I want you to go to, uh, let's see, because I want to give you a precept for that. Um, Let's go to, um, let's go to, hmm, Let's go to Psalms, because I, I think, again, I'm thinking now about the people who are on line with us, and, and some of you who are online with us, you may not understand fully some of the things that we're, we're saying, so I want to see if I can make life a little bit easier for you. All right, so let's go to Psalms, if you please, 147. And we're going to read verse 19. Book of Psalms, <clears throat> Book of Psalms, chapter 147, verse 19. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. Verse 20. He has not dealt so with any nation, and as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Most High. Now, this is challenging to a lot of people because they're saying to themselves, what are you saying? Are you saying that that no other nation is involved in this? Officer, read it again. Book of Psalms, chapter 147, verse 19. He sheweth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. Verse 20. He has not, hath not dealt so with any nation, and as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise now, the Most High. So l- let me just say this again, because people are going to be struggling with this right now, because they're saying to themselves, how can you say that? First of all, remember, the, the, the subject matter we're dealing with is a double-minded man. Now, the key that you have to look at here 
if this can only be for one group of people, which is Israel, those who are of Israel, we have to look at what is it saying. The writer says here clearly, he showeth his word unto Jacob. Now, we've read this many, many times in times past, and again, nothing changes when we read it. Another, an, another verse or word doesn't suddenly appear. It's very clear in what it says. He showeth his word unto Jacob. And so when it says that, it's really dealing with Israel. It makes it clear in the next, in the next few um, sentences. But then it says, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. So if, he is, if he's given his law to those people, the Israelites, the Hebrews, if he's only given his word, and we have to be careful again when we use the word Hebrew even, because Hebrew is a language, and remember, even Esau spoke Hebrew. So we, the emphasis is on Jacob, and the emphasis is on Israel. Now, I hope you've you got that. The other point that I want you to understand as well is this. If the law was not given to any of the other nations, it wasn't given to them, it simply means that they can't break anything. You can only break something if something was given to you by way of the law. Israel was the only nation to be given the law. Therefore, when Israel broke the law, Israel sinned. All the other nations did not get the law. Now, hold it. I know what some of you are saying. But what about spiritual? Um, the other nations become spiritual Israel. That's garbage. Is there such thing, can I become a spiritual Chinaman? No. No. I can't. Can I become a spiritual Japanese? No. I can't. I am who I am. And being, making me spiritual doesn't make me any more what I am than me using that word. And there is nowhere in the scriptures you will find the word that there is a spiritual Israel. No. No. You'll read in the book of Revelation about a spiritual Babylon, but you will not read about a spiritual Israel. Because Israel is a nation. They're a nation of people. Now, who are those, those individuals? They are the ones who have been scattered by way of the diasporas throughout the globe. And they have come in different forms by way of those being of Latino descent, those of so-called African-American descent, and those are of so-called American Indian descent. Those are the people, according to the scriptures, that are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They are the ones that this, that were, that in fact are Israel, that have been scattered. That's why the scripture says, he said, he has showed his word unto Jacob and his, and his statutes and his judgment unto Israel. Now, verse 20 makes it very clear. He has not dealt so with any nation. Now, I don't know how hard that is for, for, for those of you who are the viewing audience or the listeners to get that. Again, no matter how many times we read it, it's never going to change what it already says. He has not dealt so with any nation. It's crystal clear. And then it goes and says, and as for his judgments, in other words, his punishments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. What does it mean by that? In, in other words, they are not the ones who are being scattered. They are not the ones who have been taken into seven superpower um, dynasties over the ages, from the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persian Medes, uh, the Greeks, the Romans, etc., etc., etc. No other group has gone through those judgments but Israel. And so we see then, it's making it crystal clear to us. It is only Israel. So then, uh, 
teacher, are you saying that the other nations can't sin? Absolutely not. You can't sin if you haven't, there's not a law for you to follow. Now what they have done, they have taken the Bible and made it there. But you know, I, I, can, I can make myself a Martian, but it doesn't mean that I am a real Martian. You can't pretend to be something that you're not. All right, let's go, if you please, to Isaiah 34 and 16. Let's go there, please. Book of Isaiah, chapter 34, verse 16. Seek ye out of the book of the Most High and read, No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. For my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath, get, hath gathered them. You see that? Isaiah 34 and 16 confirm, solidify, puts a stamp on it, drop the mic on Psalms, 130, on Psalms 147, 19 through to 20. Isaiah 34 and 16 confirms it all. Seek ye out of the book of the law and read. So it's speaking to a particular group of people. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. Cannot be linked with another nation. For my mouth, uh, uh, for, for my mouth it has commanded and his spirit it has gathered them. The time is coming when it's going to gather us from all corners of the earth. All right, from here, let's go, if you please, to James chapter 4 and 8. Let's go back there again. Let's go back there again. James chapter 4 and 8. Now, remember, I did tell you that we're going to keep going backwards and forwards to it, so keep a pen in there. All right, go ahead, sir. Book of James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw nigh to Yahweh, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, double-minded. So it uses the word now to purify. Now we're dealing with that word. Remember, we were dealing with the unstable and all those different words. We've been dealing with them as we've been breaking down that uh, verse. But now we're going to deal with the word purify. In order to do that, we need to go back to Psalms 119. And verse 9. Psalm 119 and verse 9. Book of Psalms, chapter 119, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. So it makes it very clear to us. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse? Cleanse is the same word as purify. Cleanse his way. How is that going to happen? Question mark. This is how it happens. By taking heed hitherto according to thy word. It's the word that cleanses us. It's the word that purifies us. If we're not being taught if we're not reading, if we're not ingesting this word, we are not being cleansed. The beauty of the word is that we hear it and it gets into us. So then it begins to purify or cleanse us from the inside out. And when we're doing that, we have to humble ourselves. Take away pride. Take away condescendence. Take away all those prideful things that exist in the world that we sometimes use those things. For. We don't use those things in the kingdom. That's how we cleanse ourselves. And from here, let's go to John 17 and 17. Again, a well-familiar verse that we're all acquainted with. John 17, 17. Book of John, chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. 
Thy word is the truth. Notice what it says. Sanctify, set apart. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So when we keep talking about the truth, we're talking about the truth of the word telling us who we are, what we represent, and what our future is. That's the blessedness of reading this truth. We're not reading it to, for it to just tell us that, you know, Jesus saves, he keeps, and he sanctifies, because everyone will read it and think that they're, that they're all involved in that. But according to the scriptures, he's looking for his people. All right, from here, sir, let's go, if you please, to, back to James, chapter 4. And they, let's read it again. Book of James, chapter 4, verse 8. Draw nigh to Yahweh, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Now we're dealing with, with the term, the mind. Now, in order to establish that, we're going to need to go to the book of Matthew, chapter 6 and 22. Matthew chapter 6 and 22. Book of Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body be be full of light. So here is what it's saying, and follow it carefully. The light of the body is the eye. If, therefore, thine eye be single. Now, remember, it's, when we're talking about eye, it's normally speaking about singular. In your head, you have eyes, as in you have two. But here, the scripture is speaking about the eye. Now, follow me with this. If, therefore, thine eye be singular, Thy whole body shall be full of light, meaning the eye is a metaphor for the mind. There it is. The eye is a metaphor for the mind. So let's read it again with, with, with that in mind. The light of the body is the eye, is the mind. If therefore thine mind be singular, thy whole body shall be full of light. So if your mind is singular, then how can you have a double mindedness? You see that? As we've been reading, a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. And here the writers let us know that you have to have a singular focus here. And well, well, I'm at it, let me read verse 23. But if thine eye be evil, or if thy mind be evil, <coughs> thine whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? See that? So it's the mind you've got to be careful for. You've got to check the mind. Your mind must be singular. And the light of his word is what takes away the darkness, the evil, the ignorances, the backwardness that exists in the darkness of your mind. Mm -hmm. To take it further now, let's go to Luke chapter 11 and 34. I'm, I'm, nearly, I'm nearly through. This is not a long lesson today. I'll, I'll hold you long. In the book of Luke, chapter 11, verse 34, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thine whole body is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body is also, body also is full of darkness. It's full of darkness. So, let, let's now, remember what we said, the eye 
is a metaphor for the mind. And therefore, if that then be the case, we have to look at it carefully. The light of the body is the eye, is the mind. He uses the eye because the eye is, is, is a functional apparatus that's connected with the mind. Why is that so important? Because the truth is, nobody really sees with their eyes. You see with your mind. In other words, the eyes are really just a, a window that allows light to, to get in, and it sorts out the images of what you see because that's what the brain is doing. That's what the mind is doing. So it's letting us know here that the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye, your mind, is singular, remember he's confirming what we just read in Matthew, thine whole body also is full of light. And light, remember, remember we're dealing with the mind and light is a type of knowledge. But when thine eye is evil, thy whole body also is full of darkness, full of the ignorance, the backwardness. And that's why some people don't get this truth because they're still backward. Oh, I know the scriptures. No, you, 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 you read the scriptures. Reading and knowing are two very different things, sweetheart. You can't say because I've read it, I know it. I've read Charles Dickens. It doesn't mean I know it or understand the philosophy of what he was trying to get across. So it's important then that you gather that. And again, since I'm out there, let me read verse 35. Take heed, therefore, that the light, the knowledge which is in thee, be not darkness. Hmm, interesting. Let's go from here, if you please. Let's go to, uh, back to John. And we'll go to John chapter 3 and 19. Book of John, chapter 3, verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. See that? And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. What light? That light was Yahawashai. He was that light. He was that word. He was that knowledge. And men loved darkness rather than light. And he made it very clear. He said, they hate me. Jesus said that. He said, he said they hate me. They, don't, they, 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 they only hate you because, because you're associated with me. They hate the knowledge that I bring. They hate the light that I bring. They hate the fact that who I am exposes them and shows all the tyranny and the lies and, 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 and the trickery behind who they are. So he says, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Glory be to his name. Verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. If you do evil, you hate the one you call Jesus. You hate him. Oh, I love Jesus. What? And yet you have such a that's a, a, a vicious wickedness in you? No, you don't. But everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. In other words, you're, you're going to be uncovered, you're going to be exposed. But watch what it says in 21. It says, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Wonderful. Let's get another precept to go with that. Let's go to Isaiah 
uh, Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60, and we're going to read, if you please, from verse 1. Book of Isaiah, chapter 60, and verse 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Most High is risen upon thee. So it tells us, arise, get up from where you are, shine, let the exposure of what you've seen be remitted. For the light, who is the light? Yahweh shine, Jesus Christ. For thy light is come, and the glory, the power of the Lord is risen upon thee. Verse 2, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. In other words, the ignorance, the cover-up, the deceit, the Babylonian state. And what have we seen that the gross darkness, how, how is it? Oh, I haven't seen no darkness yet, because people are looking at this to think it's going to be literal darkness. It's darkness in terms of all of this, this, the deceit that man has done. I mean, now man is marrying man, woman is marrying woman, and, and they're trying to pass the bill to say that a man can have sex with a 12-year-old. Come on, that's darkness, gross darkness. And on top of that, there's a bill that's already been passed in Texas and in other states saying that a man or woman can have sex with an animal. Come on, that's darkness. How much more do we need to see before we recognize darkness? And not just darkness, the Bible says gross darkness. Worse darkness, in other words. Gross darkness, the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and the glory shall be seen upon thee, meaning he's going to use men to go out there and bring the gospel. Why is it the gospel? The good news. He's going to use the women to go out there and, and speak out and win. Because we are voices, we are vessels to be used to speak, to open up and invite our people into a safe haven. When we don't do it, it means we don't care about our brethren. But we must do it because we, well, our job is to try and save as many as we can. That's why we become saviors. Because we bring the good news. And what's the good news? The gospel is the good news, which is the glad tidings. Then it says, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. In other words, in the future, in the kingdom, those are good. they were going to have to serve the most high God. There's not going to be in the kingdom anyone talking about, well, I, I, serve, I serve Allah this, so I serve Muslim that, or Buddha this, or Confucius that. No. Oh, well, we celebrate Ramadan. No, there's going to be no Ramadan or Ramadan or whatever it is. You're not going to have any of that in the kingdom. That's why it says Pastor. the Gentiles will come, and they shall come to the light. Which light? The Word. Who is the Word? Yahweh Shine, known by the world as Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, you were going to say something. I just wanted to, uh, when it refers to Gentiles here, it's talking about uh, the Israel that has been living among the other nations and has adopted the customs and, and ways of the other nations. It's not, it's not talking about, it's, all, it's still only talking about Israel. It's speaking about the other nations as well because in the kingdom, after the thousand years, all of the, king, all of the Gentiles, of the world who are in this earth they will have to serve the most high God and serve him according to his word all of the nations 
There's only one nation that's not going to be among them, of course. We already know what that is. And I don't want to go down that uh, rabbit hole tonight. But when it comes to all the other nations, they are going to, and, and the scripture tells us, lets us know that we are going to be the ones who are going to teach them. How do we know when the kingdom age has arrived? We will no longer be trying to teach one another. That's what the scripture tells us. Right now, we're teaching one another. I'm teaching you, and you're teaching someone else, and et cetera, et cetera, and it's being done all over the globe that way. But in the kingdom, it will not be us teaching one another because he will breathe upon us and he will put in our spirit and in our mind the fullness of the glory of, of his word. And there will, not be, um, there will not be a deposit, so to speak. He breathed on the disciples. That was just a deposit, an earnest expectation but the fullness of that expectation will come when he puts his laws in us and it will and the scriptures will be in us we won't even use um a bible so to speak because it will be in us the laws his statutes and his commandments will be in us and the nations will have to learn those things from us all of these are remember there are 18 nations in the world I know people say there's a whole lot more, yes, but I'm speaking according to the scriptures. Because when, when Yahweh Shai returns, he's dealing with those that are according to the scriptures, not the ones that man have made up, because he's going to put everything back in order. From here, let's go, if you please, to Matthew chapter 5 and 14. And we'll close on that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Excuse me. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Read it one more time. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Ye are the light of the world, and a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Cannot be hid. What was it there? Read uh, 15 and 16. Verse 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bush, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. <clears throat> Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's the law dealing with the kingdom age. Now, here we are. It said, let your light so shine. Let your, let, or oh, I'm, I'm sorry, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. We are the ones that are to set the example. We're the ones with that light. Which light? We have the, we have the word of Yahweh Shai, the word of Jesus Christ, and we are to speak that word to wake our people up from their transgressions and to, and to bring them into the full knowledge of who they are according to the scriptures and be ready if they are to be a part of the blessed elect. All right. That's, uh, that's, that's where I, that's why I'm going to stop today. And I think I'm stopping just in time so, so the battery doesn't <laughs> run out. Is there any question that anyone has at this time? I'll take um, just a couple of questions. So if anyone has any questions, I'll take those questions now. Um, who among you? Um, I had a question, Pastor. Go, go ahead. Um, it was about the verse, Luke 11, 35. Um, Luke 11. Let's go there. Luke 11 and 35, okay. So is that saying that they're, like, what, what, what people refer to as, you know, like demons disguised as light, like there can be, you know. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Um, it says, take heed therefore that the light which is in thee be not darkness. So there is some light that is of darkness, like it's, it's not good light. 
Yes, because what happens is um, some of us as individuals, we have not allowed ourselves to allow the, the, the fullness of the gospel to take place in us. We're, we're, we're hovering between two opinions, um, one foot here, one foot there. So it tells us very clearly, it says, take heed, and, and, and that's a warning, by the way, hence why the title yeah. says, the, the title is, Woe to the Double-Minded. That take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. In other words, you are not going to contaminate. Because remember, many of us, we have, in, in fact, Paul put it this way. He, he said that he didn't want, and I'm going to paraphrase this instead of quote it. He, he said, I, I didn't want to um, uh, uh, try to... to show my light to people, and, and I'm paraphrasing it, and then I myself turn around and I become a castaway. In other words, I'm destroyed. I'm, I'm telling you what you've got to do, how you've got to do it, and you mustn't do this and you mustn't do that, but then me, I go around the corner and I do something completely at the opposite, and then I end up being a castaway. Oh, that's what Paul was saying, because it, it, it yeah. was trying to show us that we, we mustn't allow ourselves to become double-minded. That's why the scripture makes it very clear. It, uses, it, it pushes the point of being single-minded. In fact, it uses the term I, to have a single I, meaning to have one way of thinking about this. Because otherwise you'll find yourself drawn. And, it's, and incidentally, in case anyone thinks, well, you know, um, uh, it's easy the longer that you're in this. No, it isn't. It can happen to anyone at any time. The, the key is to remain as strong and to hold and to have a good foothold into the Word of God and don't, do not allow yourself to stray from it. Amen. All right? All right. Okay. I'd like to a, a, any other point? Do you have another point? Go ahead. Um, I was just wondering if it could also, refer, like, if that scripture could also refer to um, you know how people say there are demons that disguise themselves as light? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, um, well, yes and, and no. Bear this uh-huh. in mind as well. Um, even in the law of physics, and I think I mentioned it earlier, that even in the law of physics it says that two forces cannot exist on the same plane at the same time. In other words, one has to leave so the other one can come in. Um, that's why the scripture t- teaches us about the, about, the, about the person who had their house, meaning their, 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 their body, and it was used in the house as the example. And it said that, man, they cleaned their house, and they, and they cleaned every corner, and they got rid of all of the demons that was in their house, and, and their house now was spotless. And then the scripture says that the demon that existed in the house came back because he, he, he obviously he went away only to find that everything now has been changed. So what did he do? He recognized in order to get back in to this, this, this house that he once had dominance over, he has to go back and get his mates, get some other demons, his buddies to go with him. So, so, so this is what the scripture says. He goes back, the same demon by the way, he goes back and finds Several who are worse than him. And they then come and they invade the house and, and take possession of it. In other words, to take it to become a stronghold unto them again. That whole scenario is a metaphor dealing with the body, dealing with us as a person, because our body is, is a house. It's, it's the center of the multi God. And once we've cleaned it, our job is to make sure, make continual inspection that we are not allowing anything to creep in unaware. No. Because things will creep in, and normally they creep in by way of others who come to influence us. That's what the Bible tells us. That. This is why, notice, even Yahawashai, when Peter said something to him, he turned around, Jesus Christ, Yahweh I turned around, and he rebuked um, Peter, and he, and he said, get thee behind me, Satan. He rebuked Peter that way. Meaning what he was saying, he was saying to Peter, you are a deceiver. 
Now, he wasn't necessarily calling him the devil, but he was saying that you were acting like the devil, deceiving. So he rebuked him like that. And so it shows us that we can even be deceived by those who are close to us. And we have to be very careful. <laughs> so so it, that's why, why Yahushua said this. Uh, Jesus Christ, he said this. He said that we have to be, watch it, on our double watch. So there's a double-mindedness, but in order to overcome the double-mindedness, you're going to be on a double watch. You're watching out doubly for what could come and try to invade your life, invade your spirit, and take over and control you. Good question. Any other questions from anyone else? Or if you have more, then feel free. I said it was two, but I'll, I'll, take, I'll take one more if anyone has one. Question, Pastor. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 60, um, verse 3, where the reference to Gentiles, you said it does include the other nations because it's, it's speaking about in the kingdom. So then do, do uh, verse 1 and 2, are they from the same period from within, within the kingdom? Uh, let me just, let me just pull that out. Just bear with me just one moment. All right. Now, in order to, to understand Isaiah chapter 60, um, you, you have to jump up to verse, um, verse 10, uh, verse, uh, verse 9 and 10. And let me explain that, what you're doing there. First of all, what you, what you find in verse, verse, in fact, let me read from verse, yeah, let me read 9. It says, surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish, the Spain, first to bring thy sons from afar. Watch it. Their silver and their gold, and, uh, sorry, with them unto the name of the Most High God and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. Here it comes. Here it comes. And the sons of the strangers, shall build up thy walls and their kings shall minister unto thee for in my wrath I smote thee but in my favor have I had mercy upon thee. Now, that word that you read when it says strangers in verse 10, then the sons of the strangers, that, that word there, when you, when you, when you uh, word check that, or fact check that in the Bible, the word comes out as nakar, N-E-K-A-R. Now, that word deals with those who are outside. Remember, there is a, another version. In fact, let me go back and find it real quick once I'm out there. In Isaiah chapter... 14 and verse 1, it uses the word Gershon as for, for strangers. It's the, sa the same word stranger, but, the word, but that word stranger, when you fact check it, it doesn't mean Nakar. Because every time you read the word stranger, you can't say, oh, it's the same, it's, it's the same. But no, no, it isn't. Because it depends on what period we're dealing with. That's why it was right for you to ask the question. So, when it uses the word stranger here in Isaiah chapter 14, it's Gershon, which is the son of Moses, that were treated as outsiders because of, he, he, he married an Ethiopian woman. But then when we get to Isaiah chapter um, 60, and we're reading verse 10, that word stranger there is the word nakar which deals with those who are outside of Israel. They're not the dispersed. They're not those who, who um, were considered to be Gentiles. Because remember, our people were also considered to be Gentiles. But here, that word stranger is dealing with those who are purely of Gentile um, e um, extraction. So mm -hmm. that's N-E-K-A-R. All right? All right. All right. Okay. So I, I, again, I know it can get a little bit confusing at times. This is why when you study the scriptures, 
you have to, you cannot read a verse and read the verse as a whole. You have to break the words up as you go along or study the words as you go along. Because when you read the word Gentile in verse 3, uh, um, uh, uh, one would say, well, well, that word Gentile could mean Israel. Well, uh, again, the first time you ever read the word Gentile is in uh, Genesis chapter uh, 10. And then, and then it's speaking only about um, Japheth and his uh, descendants. But anyway, let me not get carried away. So that, yeah, but, but to answer to your point, that that's really what it's speaking about. Okay. All right. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome, sir. All right, since I've answered the two questions, and um, I, um, I'm going to then let you all go. And I hope um, that you all have a restful evening. I hope the study has been edifying to your spirit. I bid you all shalom, brokatai yahawah, yahawah bashiem, yahawah shai, speak to you again, and see you on the Sabbath.